the latest edition of Silicon Grapevine. Today, my guest is Sander Arts. Now, I'm guessing many of you will know Sander because he's a very prolific person in the industry. Uh, you see him everywhere. If you look at the list of companies he's he's worked with, I think it's, it's a huge number. But um, uh, Sander, hello, how are you? I'm, do I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. No problem. So Sander, um, you, you would describe yourself as a fractional CMO and, and normally like a we, we, we haven't so far in this series here talked to people who do the, the marketing, but I think this is actually quite an interesting uh, career you've built in the semiconductor industry around this. And I think it's quite a, uh, an interesting thing for, uh, for our viewers to see uh, sort of how the other side works in terms of not the engineer, not the, the CEO, but the somebody who helps them build their profile and get to, you know, billion dollar companies maybe. Yeah, it, you know, I I sometimes feel a little lonely in these companies. But um, I was talking to um, to Rochin Sankar uh, uh, last week, actually CEO of Fabrica, and I said to him, "I'm probably the most masochistic guy in this industry because you have to be a little bit to be like in that in those meeting rooms with people that are much smarter, asking questions that are needed for companies, but also for me to be able to do proper." Uh, marketing and communications for that. but I have enjoyed every single second of the last 25-ish um, years and I'm still um, going st going strong I think at least uh, and I'm still enjoying my time here in Silicon Valley well I, I think yeah we we, we met uh, on my last trip uh, over to Silicon Valley and I think yeah uh, I can see you're still going strong and yeah, and still very active let's go a little bit back to uh, the beginning Tell us a bit about, about your background. Yeah, so how did you sort of end up end up in in uh, well, actually it was Philips, but that before that you did a fishing tackle tackle startup, and that's your oh, passion yeah. as well, fishing. Yeah, I have a I have a big 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 passion for fishing. Fishing, we can we can talk for five, six, seven hours about that, and probably more. That's how I started. I started trading fishing tackle uh, during my college years, making some money. Uh, but quickly went and became the right hand person uh, to this uh, CEO of this company. And uh, we very quickly, we were sourcing fishing tackle out of China. And this is like 98, 99. And so we were in China at a very early, very early stages, uh, buying uh, fishing tackle, selling it in Europe, uh, which resulted in the very first uh, online fishing tackle um, website in Europe, uh, which, which Nin turned 19, out. Nine 1999 was that time when websites were all coming up. It, it was a dot-com yeah. boom, and you know everybody was getting funded. Uh, we jumped on the bandwagon and selling fishing yes. tackle. Yeah, and, but yeah. while I was doing that, um, I got a. I, I was working on my master thesis. I studied international business communications back in Nijmegen, and the in where where also NXP and Philips' uh, manufacturing facility is uh, was and is. Um, and had to write a thesis, which I decided to not do within a, a library because I'm not a big library kind of guy. So I wrote an, an email and a letter probably back in the day to Philips um, and they they accepted me in and, and I didn't know that, I, that they had placed me in the semiconductor division. <laughs> um, and that's a true story. And then when I joined, I was super excited because they showed me an org, an org chart that had communications on it, and I had studied communications. Turns out that that was the business unit. This is a true story. I've never, I've, yeah. I've actually never told anyone. Yeah. The, I was so excited to see communications on the org chart, uh, but it turns out that was the multi-billion dollar business that was providing chipsets <laughs> <laughs> into handsets, yeah. right? To make it the day because, yeah. Um, so that was my start and didn't really understand uh, uh, semiconductors, but was totally intrigued by uh, the intelligence. So I, I, I just had this thought. Um, so when you saw that communications, did you say to the CEO, oh, I'm a communications expert? <laughs> yeah, this, per this company is the perfect spot, spot for me to be in. Yeah, I didn't know that. Um, but it's the, it, semiconductors have the kindest, uh, of course, also the smartest, but the kindest people. Uh, so I noticed that I um, that I enjoyed the people uh, uh, the most, and then of course um, my which I wrote a book about later on uh, the 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 intellectual um, challenge of having to bring a technology 
uh, to market after people spend billions in some cases where they just spend five seconds uh, talking about marketing. I actually, they fast forward 25 years later, I had I had that exact same conversation with a CEO, <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you who, uh, last Ooh. week where I said, can we spend, right? If you, if you have a little bit of time and you've developed a chip and you worked on it for like, I don't know, a year, can we spend an hour talking about how we're gonna really properly put this in the market and can i then be allowed to ask my sort of crazy questions and st stupid questions in some cases and, and he said yes right so people i think appreciate and understand that it's very much needed um and like i said i'm still regardless of which company it is because they, you could say everybody's doing the same thing but that isn't true i i'm enjoying every single second of those conversations okay. to date and sometimes they're difficult but i'm really enjoying it. Now, you had about 12 and a half years and uh, you ended up uh, being at, edit, well, Philips and NXP. Tell us a little bit about the highlights and lowlights of that, uh, of that uh, and you know, what you learned from it. Well, turns out that Philips was, before it became NXP, was a highly insulated business unit, right? So it was Ooh. protected by the mothership. Um, um, Royal, Royal Which we Philips. did, I didn't, honestly, I didn't know. I probably... Nobody knew to tell you the truth. Um, so in a in an uptick, Philips would take the money. In a downturn, they would absorb the billion dollar loss. <laughs> and we were just sitting there, just being happy, doing our thing. Um, and but it was great because I learned a lot in a decently I wouldn't call them slow, but honestly, in a decently slow uh, environment, I learned a lot. Got exposed to a lot of people, also there, the smartest and the kindest people. Um, was that the time? He, was that the time of Doug Dunn? Yeah, he was there, but it was Scott McGregor. Like, oh yes, Scott, no, Scott, Ar Scott, no, okay. no, Arthur van der Poel, Scott McGregor, Frans van Houten, and then Klemmer. So I served right. four of those, uh, four, four yeah. of those, four of those gentlemen. Right, they're wow. certainly okay. gentlemen. Uh, still fondly think of all of them um, uh, when I when I think about Philips. And then, of course, Frans van Houten took the took Philips into NXP, right? Because it got it got acquired by a consortium of private equity uh, players at Bain, Silver Lake, and KKR. I don't think in. many people remember that actually. No, it was back then was the largest. <laughs> here's the PR guy in me. the The largest uh, leverage buyout in the technology space in 2006, uh, and it became mm. NXP which then became a stock-listed company again, in, where we got private, uh, became a stock-listed company in 2010, um, of which I had the pleasure to do all the marketing at NASDAQ, and there's still pictures of me smiling in front of the NASDAQ now. But, but I digre digress, right? So you said mm. how, what happened, right? So it's like yes. Philips, yeah. Philips Semiconductors was nicely tucked into Philips. It was forming had a lot of opportunity amazing technology that's still there today right uh, under uh, a court secret and and Philips had decided that they didn't want to be um, associated with the large swings of a semiconductor mm. uh, division and therefore had decided to spit it out uh, which which could have either become uh, a separate listing um, uh, right or, or at a an, an acquisition by uh, ST or Infineon or a, a merger or whatever, and but but then I think Philips decided that they wanted out and they took the money, right? So there was a multi-billion-dollar deal. They mm. they retained nineteen point nine percent, if I recall correctly, and that was the 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 beginning of a crazy journey, which I call my MBA, because all of a sudden I had these private equity people in my office asking me an insane amount of questions. And they, I didn't know, they were there to go bring the cost down. Um, but I, it became clear pretty quickly uh, that that's what they were trying to do. And they were right. Mm. So I learned mm. a lot about insource and outsource. I learned a lot about how to be effective. I learned a lot about um, not putting your ego uh, in the first place, which is a little bit of a Phillips disease. Mm. Um, and I learned that you can learn from everybody uh, and that you have to be humble because there is an enormous amount of things that you just don't know. And that's still the case today. And then NXP, so NXP just asked me to, to go to Silicon Valley uh, in 2010 
and uh, with Mike yeah. Kingen, right? Mike asked me to come to Silicon Valley to be closer to customers. Mm. Uh, I stayed for another two, three years, and then I joined a company called Admel, um, yeah. which is the next sort of phase. But, but for me, being able to work with private equity, first with Philips, then private equity, then in a different region, right at the heart here in Silicon Valley, um, was a true privilege. So I spent 12 and a half years for working for Philips and NXP uh, until I left in 2012. And, and then uh, I think you, you went, as you said, to Atmel. And then, but uh, by the way, Mike, Mike was uh, one of my early guests on this uh, on this uh, series. So um, he's uh, he's a real gentleman. Has a he's a true has friend. A, uh, has a lot of. Um, I think uh, one of the things I learned um, from talking to him was about building networks and you know using those networks. And I think that's kind <laughs> of what Silicon Valley is all about. Yeah. Well, you know, it it. it if you if you don't know anyone, the only person you need to know is Mike because you call Mike yeah. and go, "Hey, do you know this person?" And Mike goes, "Yeah, I know this person." And then if you're kind enough to Mike, uh, yeah. sometimes I am. I think uh, he will certainly help you. Yeah, Mike is Mike is awesome. And so, um, what was the the trigger sort of to go from NXP to Atmel? And I and I think uh, then your sort of independent career. I think there's there's two stages there. Yeah, Atmel offered me uh, an opportunity to be part of their executive team. Uh, and at mm. NXP, they had pushed me down one level, and I didn't like okay. it uh, because okay. you don't want to work for uh, a sales organization as CMO uh, first. Oh. And secondly, you don't yeah. want to be uh, having business units in your neck, uh, cutting costs um, without alignment with the CEO. That's that's the story. I know that that sounds a little... I'm not frustrated about it, but I just didn't want to do it anymore. Um, and yeah. I had a centralized organization, and I believe that you need to have a little bit of a central point because I think a CEO needs to be in day-to-day -day contact with the CEO. And some of that didn't um, happen anymore. And then you have the individual agendas of the business units. And we had like four or five, I don't know, maybe seven. So all of a sudden I had like seven bosses and a real boss, and they got a little sick and tired of it. Um, and Atmel offered me... yeah. Steve Laup offered me a position on his executive team, um, which was a great team. And we were selling amazing technology, right? The 8-bit AVR microcontroller is still in many, many, many designs. Uh, and Steve had the ambition to become big in touch. And Steve also had the ambition to be an IoT company. And that's exactly what we did. Okay. Um, I mean, you had like, uh, was it uh, four, four years there? Uh, and then, yep. And then... Um... What was the thing that made you say, okay, well, look, uh, I'm going to go and, and do my own thing? Or was that, <laughs> was that oh. somebody? Yeah, it's Because like, then that sort of was uh, the, the start uh, for, of, of something big, even bigger for you. Yeah. Well, so, so the, 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 the non-romantic version of that story is that when Microchip comes in and they acquire a company, the first thing they do is they get rid of every single manager in the business. Right. I don't think it's smart, but I'm not going to argue with their market cap and success. Yeah. Uh, but I think you lose a lot of uh, intelligence and, uh, and and history. But So that's also what happened to us, right? On the mm. first day of that acquisition, at 8.15 in the morning, I, w I had the pleasure to be uh, let go <laughs> <laughs> by, uh, by microchip management uh, in a hilarious uh, conversation. Um, and so I just left. And then I, you know, if you... It's kind of funny because I didn't grow up poor, but we didn't have a lot in my household. And that's that. That's not even criticism whatsoever. Mm. Um, but when somebody gives you a little bit of money and you then have a little bit of time, you think you want to like retire or whatever. And for like two weeks, I had that dream <laughs> until my wife told me to get out of her kitchen. Uh, and I talked to a few people and they wanted me to uh, be a consultant. And I had already decided that I didn't really want to go back to corporate life anymore. So I I, I had already uh, started an LLC and I, so I have my own right? so it's a separate legal entity. And I had my branding and I had the, and had the idea of writing a book. So we were doing all those things. I had a Stanford a bit, a business case a study. So I had a lot of stuff and I had my reputation and my name already. Uh, because Ooh. we had done amazing things uh, at Atmel, right? We certainly put Atmel on the map with a variety of marketing strategies that people wouldn't have uh, uh, thought of earlier, clearly. And um, so I started helping a bunch of people, uh, friends uh, also, and um, one of them, Steve Flagg, uh, CEO, founder of SupplyFrame, uh, who was a very Ooh. close friend. 
uh, and I helped him all his marketing and go to market for a number of years. Uh, and then Matt Murphy called me and Matt Murphy asked me to be uh, the fractional CMO over at Marvell because he had just yeah. become uh, the CEO over there uh, yeah. after uh, Sahat and Wei Li uh, had uh, left the day-to-day -day operation and they had been moved onto the board. Yeah. That's... And then I was off to the races. Yeah. I mean, it's a real parallel. I think we were talking about it earlier. Um, so with, with, when we did the ARC IPO, and then 2002, I think we had a new CEO placed by the board. Uh, and uh, he called me up on Sunday morning and said, oh, I've just hired another uh, uh, director of communications, so we can't have two, so you'll have to go. And uh, so uh, I, that started my six months of gardening leave. And then I thought, uh, like you, I thought, oh, I can retire. And, uh, and yeah. then, yeah, I played a bit of golf. And then I bought some golf clubs, but I played a bit of golf. And, and then um, one of the investors, Apex Partners, said, oh, Nitin, um, we've got this CEO um, who might need your help. And it was a small company called uh, on NASDAQ called Dialog Semiconductor. So that started a six-year relationship with them. So that was quite interesting. But yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of where you think you've... And yeah, same same as you. My wife said, okay, you need to, you need to do a bit more. <laughs> Don't be retired in my kitchen. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know... Um, that's quite interesting because then that sort of snowballed. Um, I mean, if if I if I was to read the list of companies you're you're associated with even now, I mean, I, I, I do Acceler AI, uh, in Fabrica, Orca, Efabulous, um, Neuro, Neurofos, uh, Sintient, Grok. You know, they're all the the current names. Intrinsic ID, which you just I, uh, had that exit with uh, uh, with Synopsis, uh, even with Arduino, Mythic. You know. How do you, I guess it's that closeness of Silicon Valley, which allows you to get in and into all of these and that reputation that helps you. How do you manage all of that? Well, <laughs> well, I don't, I don't, I don't have them, all of them as client at this particular point in time. But no, no, I, quite... know, I know, but you know, for example, I think it's that networking that allows you to get into them. And then how do you, uh, I think, is it because of the reputation that helps you to, to work with these companies? Yeah, well, so I talk to everybody, um, uh, probably aspiring to be the next uh, Mike Nonan. So I try to I try to just get uh, acquainted with everybody, uh, as you do actually, right? Because yeah. you do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and then sometimes these conversations evolve in, hey, you know, we need some help because we're gonna come out of stealth. Of hey, do you mm. know somebody that can help us build a website that we need a logo? In the case of Orca, I, and then I help them on the position, uh, as you've seen. Other people ask me to run their sales or they say, hey, you know, I need a distribution strategy or um, uh, in the case of uh, Enfabrica, I needed to come out of stealth, right? Or just, but but there have been larger entities like uh, DuPont and Merck, uh, right? People that need leads or some, sometimes it's something super specific. And then I think what happens is, is that they realize that it's handy to have me around because I know a lot of people. Um, so I, so it's just helpful. Um, and then there is a voice in the, in the company that isn't necessarily a voice that they already have. Right. Um, um, and mm. it's, and it's good to have somebody of my, I don't know, of my caliber sounds a little arrogant, but you, you can, you get me at a fractional of the cost because yeah. these people don't want to bread, buy a or afford a full-time CMO because now you're in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, it's 150 to 200 for less. isn't it? <laughs> so if you do a full-time CMO, yeah, it's, it's a huge Yeah, it's expensive. Uh, and and yeah. you know, CMO ship is dependent on where the company is in its, in its maturity or whatever, in which stage it is. Sometimes you don't need a full-time person, right? Mm -hmm. And you can always mm -hmm. scale it up or down or whatever. Uh, and that's the 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 the, um, the dynamic that is going on. Uh, and so, at any given time, I have a book of business with a variety of clients, and it's all out in the open. There's every single company that I'm assisting is on my LinkedIn, so there's not like a secret list or whatever, uh, so that everybody knows what is going on at, at whatever given time, uh, and that everything is in the, out in the open in full disclosure. I guess one of the the challenges that uh, all these companies have is. Uh, they may have come, and yeah, I've interviewed a lot of them. Yeah, they may have come uh, from engineering or technology backgrounds, and they just don't have that other 
aspect of that thinking in, in terms of what's important, you know, what needs to be communicated, and you know, what, what is a USP. And I think that's where you help them to bring it out, isn't it? Yeah, and some, yeah, yes, that's very much the case. And in some cases, I'm also um, a little uh, disappointed about my impact <laughs> okay. myself, because there is a bunch of stuff happening right now in AI where the world just sort of keeps rehashing the same messages. And I'm actually mm. not struggling, but I'm really intrigued by that space, um, wanting to make campaigns that say something else than what everybody else is saying. Right, everybody's democratizing compute. Everybody is speeding it up. Everybody's bringing the total cost of ownership uh, down. Everybody has a purpose-built architecture. Everybody has, has a better chip than NVIDIA, etc., mm. et which is all amazing. Right, I'm not trying mm. to be negative about any of those, but but what's the silver bullet that that brings those messages in a decently crowded space, especially also now with the world just paying an enormous amount of attention to it? Yeah. Um, so that you get that message out. Um, where people pay attention um, that, that are in key decision-making places. And sometimes I think it goes so fast that we're not even doing a proper job to tell yeah. the truth, including myself. Well, even at EE Times, I find, you know, the, I'd like to go into depth with things and there's so much out there and it's very difficult to um, you know, sort of get the real, so what is real, what is the real impact of this? And I think yeah. that's kind of, uh, kind of where I try and get to, but it's not always easy. No, well, you know, so it's so everything in life is a give and take, <laughs> yeah. I guess. But the, so being at the forefront of technology and innovation in AI right now means that, that this the situation that I just described is the situation that I just described. If I go back, if I were to go back to like a microcontroller franchise, right, you become the head of marketing for um, not necessarily microcontroller franchises, but like in, Infineon, or ST Micro, or became a head of marketing at know, Broadcom or Marvell, then then there's stuff, right? You're marketing a business that already exists, which is not which is also easier to tell you the truth, right? Because like we have been supplying microcontrollers into the automotive space for the last 15 or 20 years, and let's just continue to launch the next microcontroller, which is incrementally incrementally better and faster than the previous one. It's like, <clears throat> yeah, with all due respect for all of those people that are doing that, that's easier. Mm, mm. You know, through through your um, career, um, what what what's been the your your sort of proudest moment? Uh, you know, what do you feel like? Uh, okay, this is a, a real sense of achievement. Is it is it an exit from the company, or is it you know, one one of the sort of uh, roles you've done within the organization, or or is it something else? Uh, no, it's something. It's. Uh... I don't really think that highly of myself to tell you the truth. I think the ability to continue to reinvent yourself and take people on that journey with you, right? So I still have a lot of people um, reach out and say, hey, if you ever became full-time CMO somewhere, we would love to work for you again. Okay. That means a lot, right? So yeah. the ability to go do something with a team, and I have dear, dear, dear friends from back in, from back to dating back to 2000, right in the Philips days that I worked with and that worked with me um, in a very non-hierarchical fashion because I'm not really that guy, right? We just have to do all, everything together. Um, that's probably the most, the thing that I'm most proud of. So the, 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 all the people that are still my connections and that I still enjoy talking to from back in the day, um, and and but also maybe to say something positive about myself, right? The ability to, um, I've been able to reinvent myself and stay relevant uh, for the last uh, twenty five years, right? So going out of semiconductor company and then doing this for a living um, in Silicon Valley for the last fifteen years. So I've been here fifteen years. Is um, yeah, you know, okay. It's death. Every now and then, when I have a second to think and to be proud of something that's maybe that comes to mind, but it's probably more the people uh, and then the global network that I've built uh, and the stories that I have gathered with those people uh, that I'm most proud of. Fascinating. More books, I'm sure. And um, I, you mentioned some names uh, through this conversation. Um, is there anybody you feel like you know, were really great sort of mentors or people you, you've 
you've sort of helped you along with oh, your yeah. career. And I, you mentioned one of them, but I think uh, I was no. wondering whether that would be the one or whether it be others as well. No, there, yeah, no, no, there's a whole bunch. So um, um, Frans van Houten, right, who was my first. So all of a sudden I found myself in a boardroom uh, and he allowed me in, right? And Ooh. I was young, probably 30. And I was in the CEO office, um, has been, um, I recently left Philips, right? And, which is, he deserves a statue for the things that he, that he did for Philips. I, I don't think mm. the Dutch media are appreciative of the things that he did also during COVID. Uh, but that's a different story. So he's a true mentor and a friend uh, still. Okay. Uh, worked for Frans Schaper, uh, who recently retired and lost job that he had was CEO of Intel in Europe. He taught me how to take care of people um, uh, and how to really manage also being very, very, very demanding, uh, but incredibly fair. Mike Noonan, but Mike is a friend, right? So Mike is a multifaceted person in my life that does a whole bunch of things. Uh, Steve Laub, CEO of uh, Admel, I had dinner with him a few weeks ago. One of the smartest people I know, um, very trusted sort of advice. If I need something or not need something, but if I'm struggling with something, I call him and I tell him that I need some adult supervision <laughs> and then he understands. <laughs> he understands <laughs> that that's the case. Um, yeah. Uh, Steve Flagg, who is the, the, the best business chess player in the world, uh, right? <laughs> Build a whole business, sold it to Siemens. Yeah, he's truly remarkable. Very yeah. smart. And then I probably, I shouldn't have rolled out a list of people because now I missed. Now you have to do a lot more. No, no. Yeah, I, I think, I'm going to yeah. regret saying this because now I have like six where I'm like, oh shit, I should have mentioned that person. But, but, but you know, my, my, this is going to sound, I don't want it to sound cheesy, but my son, right? My son just graduated from San Luis Obispo. Um, and he is representing like the next wave of people, uh, shows me kindness, uh, and shows me, um, more balance, which I don't have. I just work and that's what, that's what I do. <laughs> um, and it's, so I learned a lot from, it's not a hierarchical thing. It's like, oh, here's seven CEOs. That's not what it is. I, I, you, you learn from everybody because everybody has their own perspective. Everybody has their own story. Um, so it's not a, oh, I only learned from a, a CEOs. It's there's all these people every single day uh, that I learn from. I talked and I talk to everybody, which I enjoy talking to people, but I just talk to everybody. Uh, and you always get a good story or so insight, which is super interesting, especially here in Silicon Valley, because everybody is uh, very switched on, as you know. Uh, that's why I love Silicon Valley so much. And yeah, that's why I've spent so much time there in the last, I don't know, since 1995. So yeah, it's, 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 awesome. um, it's the best place on earth. Uh, definitely for what we do. So the, the thing I was going to ask you is sort of uh, really sort of to close off. Um, what are your hobbies? I, I know you said fishing. So do you spend a lot of time fishing? And I, 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 I guess, uh, do you get time for that? You know, working with all this stuff? Yeah, not enough, a little bit. And as you get older, I don't know. I don't know. Whoever is watching that's also like 50. <laughs> you start to look back with regrets and you start to look forward with anticipation, but you don't know how big that anticipation should be. Um, so you're a little bit more sort of concerned about things that you should be doing. So I like, I like to cook. Uh, I grow my own vegetables, and I, but I also grow my own flowers and do all of that stuff. And then I like to fish, and I think there is a bunch of things that I would still like to do. But I'm, I will get there. I just want to get there in good health, uh, which sometimes it's not easy, right, to stay healthy when you do. It's, I this morning I was up at five, talking to people in uh, in Europe because mm -hmm. I do have a bunch of business over there. Yeah, the f fishing is super interesting. Uh, to me and f for outsiders it's like oh just whatever right but if you once you um um study it a little bit and you see how multifaceted it is i don't want to over intellectualize yeah. fishing but, yeah yeah um, it's yeah there is a lot going on <laughs> well any given time and it's the ultimate relaxation for me at least and what excites you uh today uh, and about the future um there's a, there's a lot of doom about AI doing this and whatever, but I guess there's also opportunity. And uh, it's not about the AI, but is there something that really excites you about this industry, about life, about yeah, the future? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think AI is going to do anything. It's not by yeah. itself, right? Yeah. AI is going to do something because it's going to be steered by people. 
Mm. Um, and so I help, but so I do, it's kind of interesting. So I help the infrastructure people, right? So people that just put in compute. Yeah. Uh, so I still talk on a, on a, on a regular basis with uh, Jonathan Ross, by the way, should have mentioned him on the list. Yes. Croc. Yes. Absolutely brilliant. Also has the best sense of humor uh, ever. Uh, but Ro Rochin Sankar and his co-founder Shrajit, uh, but over at the Fabrica building, uh, right, helping build infrastructure be uh, more efficient and more uh, cost-effective, and and having more performance. Um, the, all of and Accelera, right, in Ito, we should have mentioned uh, Fabrizio on the list of CTOs that are inspiring. That's one thing. It's like, hey, the world's going to go put in a whole bunch of compute so that the world can go do stuff. But that do stuff component is probably the next wave, which is super interesting to me. And mm -hmm. I'm, so I'm assisting a few of those, uh, actually. So like, I don't know what it's called, but the vertical solutions that yeah. rest on top of the infrastructure yeah. are interesting. One of them is a company called Class Genius. And Class Genius builds tools for teachers, AI tools for teachers. Uh, with the the ultimate sort of value proposition of um, teachers, give teachers their Sunday afternoon back, because right there is a lot of teacher burnout, uh, a lot of people just aren't able to uh, keep up with all the yeah there is uh, lesson yeah. plans that need to be created, the homework that needs to be checked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And AI is perfect for that. And and the, the, so not only that, but also the sort of the underprivileged sites of society uh, with kids being just sort of falling through the system, uh, that's where um, a lot of this stuff is going to uh, help. Potentially. Tremendously. I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, doing that. So we closed a, a deal actually last week with, um, I shouldn't say it actually because we're doing press release next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but oh, this is going to come out. Uh, yeah. So we closed the deal with an organization called City Year. And City Year helps uh, underprivileged uh, areas, East Palo Alto, East San Jose, making sure that these kids just make don't fall out of the system. And and AI is going to be a great, great uh, tool for that. But it first needs to be touched by people, which is what's happening. And there's a few others that I'm assisting. Uh, that's yeah. what I'm really excited about. So I can't wait to see what the world is going to build in a positive fashion. Um, with the compute and the ability to go do more things with the infrastructure that the, that the world has put in. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to sort of last question. Um, you talked about your son, but you know, not just your son, but you know, young people who want to do what you're doing or just general advice. What would you give a young Sander? What, what would you advise him knowing what you know now? Or him or her? Um... A young person. I do a lot. I do a lot with universities, right? Card Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. So I talk. I talk to young people. I think um, play a little bit more. I just just move around an organization. I just went. I just went up, which there is nothing wrong with it. But I think it's good to sort of play around in different uh, verticals, right? Go check out a sales organization. Go check out a marketing organization. Um, uh, go check out procurement if you're interested. I don't know, um, but I yep. think maybe that could be an interesting uh, path. And then um, enjoy your time a little bit more. So I, I probably did uh, multi multiple hundreds of intercontinental trips, right, across the globe. And I, in some cases, just because you have a young family, you really want to go home like really fast. And I should have probably spent half a day here and half a day there uh, without looking at a computer. Um, and just enjoyed the, um, the the scenery and or the food and the people uh, a little bit more. But um, but just looking around without um, judgment and trying to learn from everybody in the world, right? Because everybody is wired because of education and the way they were raised and their culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it takes a while to get out of it. So also make yourself be in situations where you're uncomfortable with what people are saying and, and what people are doing because you may be just not understanding it and you might be uh, wrong right which but it's not wrong that you're wrong that's just what happened when you were raised in the system that you were raised in uh, so keep an open mind you know and just play a little bit more uh, as opposed to only working well sander thank you very much thank you